Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Weaver. Welcome back to the Blue and Yellow Kitchen. In each episode, I make a dish inspired by a new book while talking to its author. This week's book is Sobre Mesa, and I'm making Dulce de Leche Gelatin Mold. I'd like to welcome the author of Sobre Mesa, Josephine Caminos Oria. Welcome, Josephine. Hi, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. Well, we're so glad to have you in the kitchen. So let's start with the concept of Sobre Mesa, which uh, people in the United States are probably not familiar with. So let's start there. Sure. Sobre Mesa is the time spent lingering around a table well after the food is gone. In Argentina, it's almost considered the final course. That's great. And so tell us what the book's about. So I grew up having Sobre Mesa almost every day of my life, I would say. And the book is told through all different Sobre Mesas throughout my 20s to about my mid 40s. And it's about my journey back to Argentina belonging to myself, to a country, finding um, second and third chances. That's great. And what inspired you to write the book? You know, the book came to me about three years ago. I was on a walk in Charleston with my husband, and the idea came to me, and I simply couldn't let it go. Um, I got this idea that just said, you have to tell the world about Soda Misa. They're going to need it. And it's interesting that it's coming out now, you know, as we're... Um, still in quarantine and navigating this new normal. Yes, and, and one of the things that I told her was that I have friends who have these really lovely parties that um, that generally I usually go just for a fairly short amount of time. Um, half the one of the one of the guys in the couple is a is Mexican American, and I think his his take on entertaining is way more relaxed. And so this last time they had a party was February twenty twenty. And for whatever reason that day, I just decided to stay. And I stayed and stayed and stayed. I think I was there three hours. I actually burned a roast that was in the oven at home. Uh, but then, the, you know, we ha went into lockdown. And that has been such a beautiful memory for me of, of being, having those conversations over the table, eating a little bit, talking a little bit, maybe eating a little bit more, not eating, you know. So when I when I understood what the concept of Sobre Mesa was, I thought, oh, I, I definitely have experienced that, and I want more of that when I'm able to sit down with people again who aren't Marco, microwave boy. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely. They, That's yeah, when so, the true conversations and connections happen. 100%. So thank you for introducing that to us. Is there anything that readers need to know beforehand about the book? Like, what's some of the sort of selling points of it for us? Well, you know, I think while the book is my story, I hope that it's everyone else's too. Maybe they have their own abuela. It talks about food, the food they ate, has a lot of culinary time travel. And I liken it, Stephanie, to almost like Laura Esquivel's, um, like Water for Chocolate. There's a lot of magical realism in it. And it, I almost feel like it reads like a novel, to be honest. But it is my story. Yes, absolutely. So if you love Like Water for Chocolate, either the book or the movie, you definitely will love this book. It's part of the reason why I chose it. Um, I love the bicultural life um, going between Argentina, the United States, Pittsburgh, Miami, um, the Pampas, Buenos Aires. You know, there's just a lot of, of travel around. And it, I felt like I got such a beautiful taste of a culture that I'm not that familiar with because I think a lot of times in the United States, when we think of Latin culture, they're fairly limited. You know, we think of Puerto Rico and Mexico and maybe two or three other countries. And how many countries are in Latin America? Is it 30 or 33 or something? I think, you know, I think it's 31. 31. Okay. It was somewhere, somewhere in the middle there. So, and I love the recipe connections that you made. So each chapter, she starts talking about a recipe and then the recipes at the end of the chapter. So, um, and that is a beautiful segue into what I'm making today or what I've made today, which is the dulce de leche gelatin mold. So we chose this, um, we chose this recipe for two couple reasons. Uh, Josephine's family's always made dulce de leche. This is the product, so she actually has a company that makes it. I'm gonna show you all because if you're not familiar with it, you might just think, so it's like milk jam, right? Is that the culinary proper description? It is, it's actually a milk preserve. It's milk preserved down the same way you would a fruit. Right, so it's sugar and vanilla and, um, and so, I'm going to have her read um, when she the first time she tried to make it on her own, which is a, just a great story. And you, you spent hours and hours pr pr 
perfecting the recipe, and now your company, La Dorita, sells oh, it. This, yeah. is, this is La Dorita. This is your grandmother on the, cover, on the label. Um, so while Josephine's reading, I'll get the gelatin mold ready to unmold. We'll talk about the recipe after she reads. Can you set up a little bit what you're about to read and then go ahead and read it for us? Sure. I am about to read um, a segment, a conversation that I had with my husband one morning after I awoke with this innate desire to make dulce de leche. I'm about 35 years old. I have four boys. I'm the CFO of a medical company. I'm about my 12th year into that position. And all of a sudden, I have this epiphany in the middle of the night that I need to make dulce de leche. So um, I call my grandmother in Argentina to ask her for the recipe. Dorita was half asleep when she answered my call. Abuela, I said, notepad in hand. Buen dia, did I wake you? Josie, hola mi amor. No, I was just getting up. How are you? I'm good, thanks for asking. I'm actually calling because I need your dulce de leche recipe. I myself was trying to catch up with this newfound conviction that had come to me during the night. Dulce de leche, but why? Can't you find any in Pittsburgh? I'm sure your mommy could send you some from Miami. I know, but I want to make it myself. The dulce de leche you fed us when we were younger. No lo hagas, Josie, my grandmother said. Milk is very fickle. You have to tend to the pot for hours. And to be honest, I don't know if you have that sort of patience or time. But I insisted, and reluctantly and impatiently, she began reciting the dulce de leche process by heart. In true Dorita fashion, without any detail as to measurements or cooking times. Reluctant because she wanted to spare me the despair and frustration of ending up with a pot of scalded milk after stirring it for two hours straight. Impatient because I kept asking for details she wasn't able to provide. I cross-examined her. But abuela, what temperature do I boil the milk to? Should I get a candy thermometer? Why would you? You do realize it's not candy, she said. It's a preserve. I know, but at what point am I supposed to add the sugar? And how large of a teacup should I use to measure it? Do I add it all at once? It depends on the milk and the amount of fat it has. That changes from animal to animal and the time of year. Once you get a feel for the milk, the rest will come to you. Sometimes you'll need more sugar, sometimes less. Really, Abuela? As if that's what I need to hear. I hung up the phone with what seemed like half of a recipe. I'd have to work on filling in the blanks by trial and error. That evening, after tucking the kids into bed, I began experimenting with pot after pot of scalded milk. I went through at least five gallons that first weekend, and on the third day, finally came up with a lumpy, golden spread that was edible, but more of a syrup in consistency. I was slowly coming to understand exactly at what, what it was that Donita had tried to tell me. Stir constantly until either you feel your arm is going to fall off, or you're on the verge of screaming uncontrollably. Also, it's wise to have someone you adore talking to in the kitchen while you're making it, or if you've truly mastered the art of keeping a telephone under your chin without it falling to the floor, a call with a good friend always makes the time go faster. Just, Josephine, thank you. So I think that gives you viewers and readers a, a taste of the book, um, a taste of the humor, of the characters, of Josephine's beautiful writing style. And the sort of just the flavor of an Argentinian American family and, you know, the desire for the American in you to, to have the cup amount and the how much and how long and what temperature and your grandmother's right. just, no, Josie, that's just not how it works. You have to learn the milk. And <laughs> it just makes me laugh every time I think about it. And, you know, the image of you wanting to scream is because your arm's going to fall off is so great. Okay, so uh, so you normally make this in a very large, in a regular size bunt cake pan, correct? For your family, I do. Okay, I do. So I, remember, I have five children. Yeah, she has five children. So I've got. A, I'm going to show you all. So I have it. It's a. This is a mini bunt pan. I've only and it's a quarter recipe. So I'm only making two, and we're going to hope for the best. Actually, I think I'm going to do it this way. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Okay, so we're going to flip it. I did loosen it with a butter knife, as she told me to, and nothing is happening. Okay, so it needs to be more loosening, apparently. Maybe just give it a little pound on the top. A little pound, okay. Oh, and that did it. <laughs> you saying that did it. 
Okay, so one went upside down and one went right side up, but that's okay. They did hold together, so they're definitely a better texture this time. This is the second time I've made it, and uh, all right, so let's <laughs> let's show them off. All right, how did that? How does that look, ma'am? That looks perfect. Oh, all right. Well, I'll take perfect any day. Uh, I like that. It's wiggly formed, and it looks like it's screaming for a little bit of maybe whipped cream when you eat it. Looks for sure, whipped cream would be lovely. What I'm going to do, actually, I'm not going to risk moving it to the plate because I don't want it to fall apart, but I'm going to go ahead and give it a little taste because um, one of them is, a, the one that went upside down is a little less happy than the other one. Mmm. All right, so if you've ever had, um, oh, I'm completely blanking on what it's called, panna cotta. If you ever had panna cotta, mm -hmm. it's in that general region of dessert. So creamy, very strong caramel notes, very rich, hint of vanilla. It's delicious. Um, it's definitely something that I, I, you know, it's rich. So I don't know that I would eat. This is would be definitely be plenty for me. I had to laugh when you said it. You know, the bunt size full one that serves a family of seven. And I thought they, <laughs> those kids must really chow down on this because it was. It's very rich, but delicious. Oh, um, kids and yeah. adults, Stephanie. Kids, kids and, and adults. adults. Yes, absolutely. And it's a beautiful way to showcase the on the product that you make, which is unique to your company. And and I would say that if you've had, um, viewers, if you've had Dulce de Leche flavored anything in this country, this is not that. This is the proper milk preserve that cooks down all the milk protein with the and the milk sugars and then adds the sugar to, to preserve it. So really beautiful. And it's you, you said it's kind of used like Nutella is in Italy where it's spread on everything. It's it's used throughout the morning and throughout the day, you know, starting at the morning on the breakfast table and throughout the day in desserts. Fantastic. But if you don't mind saying one quick thing about the Jello, yeah. I really love those, this recipe because, you know, I usually make flan when I make a custard, but this recipe to me is the perfect mix of my Argentine American. Nice. My daughter wanted to make Jello and I've never really been a fan of Jello. It just wasn't part of our dessert repertoire. And so this is our halfway, our dulce de leche gelatin. Both, you know, both flags are in this dessert there. I love that. I love it because it's sort of the perfect, uh, the perfect expression of your Argentinian American life, right? So yeah, that's fantastic. Exactly. Great. Okay. So the recipe tip that I'm going to share um, today is I did uh, make a quarter recipe. So on the website, on my website, you'll find Josephine's full recipe in order to make in, in order to quarter it, I had to do it um, metric and do a bunch of math. So um, so I will include that in case you want to make a smaller amount, but you will need a metric uh, food scale in order to do that because it's kind of small amounts of certain things. All right. The only other thing I did um, because I got some kind of gelatin lumps the first time I made it was I started the hot water in the blender on low and just added the gelatin as the water was running to make sure everything got really smoothly done. And then the prep is like five minutes. It's a really quick prep and then it's just overnight in the fridge. So it's a very hands-off recipe, right. which is great. Okay. So um, before we go, Josephine, tell us a little bit more about your writing process. How did the working on the memoir go? Like what were some of the things about it that you enjoy doing and anything you struggled with? Oh gosh, struggled, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was I really struggled with the timeline because when you're writing a memoir, there's just so much and you really have to choose what the poignant points are. It took me about three years, Stephanie, um, from start to finish. And believe it or not, last February when we were all asked to stay at home, or was it March? I forget. Um, my husband and I sat down. He sat down with me and chapter by chapter in two and a half weeks, I finally rewrote it. We had nowhere to go, so it was the perfect timing. Oh, that's great. And then do you have a favorite character or moment in the book? Oh, gosh, they're all, all of these characters are so up in my heart. Every single person in my book, they're in there because I absolutely love and adore them. Um, I think some of my favorite moments of writing were um, the heated moments with my husband when we first meet, for instance, where we just do not get along. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And it was fun. It was fun to go back and relive those moments um, and, you know, see, to see how far we've gotten now. Yes. 
Um, I mean, it absolutely read like uh, fiction in, in those parts for sure. And, um, you know, as soon as he showed up, I was like, oh, she's going to fall in love with him. You know, they're not getting along. And so I had that kind of rom I didn't want to, but yes. <laughs> and he seems like a wonderful man. And he seems like he's been a great dad. And uh, But that was in at the Pampas, at the ranch. It was kind of this... Uh, financially, there was a lot of negative stuff happening, and you were there to sort of straighten things out. And he didn't really right. appreciate you being there to straighten things out because he was running it. And right. um, so it was kind of a it was a kind of a nice setup for there to be a, a clash and um, and a, a little bit of tension there. Um, the other character that I really enjoyed was your gentleman caller. I don't want to give too much away, but you have a, this is a mag magical realism element. There's someone who from your family perhaps who shows up at certain times to give you messages. And I really liked that and appreciated that and found it really intriguing. So I wanted to thank you for not shying away yeah. from, from including that because uh, it makes the book really special yeah. and different. No, of course. And writing the book was very cathartic for me because this was a, um, I would say spiritual visitor that started coming to me after a car accident at 16. Um, and I really couldn't make sense of it, and I kept a lot of it to myself. I, I would talk about him with my mother and my um, husband, you know. But anyway, there was a moment, and there's a poignant moment in the book, probably one of my most favorite, where I really come to understand who he is and why he had been with me for 20 years. Yes. I um, haven't seen him since that moment. Yeah. So we never know who will come into our lives, though. Who will come in? based on the meal we have and the sobre mesa we have, right? That's, that's <laughs> absolutely true. Well, I want to thank yeah. you so much for being here today and sharing your culture. I think the book is such an interesting look at bicultural life and certainly expanded my horizons about Argentina and um, the people who live there and the, their relationship with the United States. So I want to thank you. I think you did a really beautiful job. And I loved, I'm definitely going to try some of the recipes. The lentils especially sounded so good. So I'm excited to, to dive into some of the recipes as well. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about Argentina. And, I, and one of my favorite things about the book is that like you or anyone who reads it, you can visit Argentina from the comfort of your, you know, your armchair or your favorite reading nook. Absolutely. And so again, if you're frustrated about not being able to travel, this would be a great choice right now to kind of have that armchair travel experience as well as um, that bicultural experience, which is terrific. So you'll find the recipe link for this just delicious dulce de leche gelatin mold on my website or in the link uh, the comments of the Facebook video. My website is mygreenreliefrecipes.com. You'll find Josephine at laderita.net. Order a copy of Sobre Mesa. It's launch week, so the book just came out yesterday. Um, you can order it from any of your favorite bookstores or online. And if you don't have a book buying budget right now, then ask for your local library to carry the book because that helps authors as well because the libraries purchase the books for that. Follow me at sweavermph so you don't miss an episode and join us next time for another author interview and a dish inspired by their book. Thanks so much for watching The Blue and Yellow Kitchen.